Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Sue Haupt of the NSF National Center for Atmospheric Science. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth installment of this European American Collaboration on Wind Energy monthly webinar series. Um, this series is fostered by myself and Jakob Mann of Danish Technical University. Um, it's an opportunity to get together every other uh, once a month on the second Wednesday of the month. And uh, here's some of the latest research on wind energy science. This morning, uh, you're going, or this morning in the US, this afternoon in Europe, uh, you're going to be hearing from Dr. James Sear, who's a research professor of aerospace engineering science at University of Colorado Boulder. This is after 27 years as professor of mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering, and mathematics at Penn State University, and he retains an emeritus professor status there. Uh, Jim is a fluid dynamicist, extensive experience in turbulence physics, turbulent flows, large eddy simulation, including atmospheric and reacting turbulent flows. Um, he also has ex expertise in mechanics and physiology. He uh, did his PhD in aeronautics and astronautics um, at Stanford University and completed postdoctoral positions at NASA Ames, University of Southampton and Johns Hopkins University. He's been a visiting professor and scientist at a number of institutions and served on governing boards of the American Physical Society and APS Division of Fluid Dynamics. Um, Jim is a member of the Johns Hopkins Society of Scholars and a fellow of the American Physical Society. Today, he's going to be talking about non-steady non load responses to atmospheric and mountain turbulence eddies relevant to main bearing function, a validation study with NREL GE 1.5 megawatt wind turbine. Jim, you have the floor. Go ahead and share your screen. Thanks, Sue. All right, and thanks uh, for having me. Uh, welcome, everybody. Let me get rid of this uh, bar. It's not in my way. Share my screen. I mean, share my presentation. Okay, so, so thank you very much for having me. So yes, as Sue said, um, today's discussion will focus on local interactions between turbulence, turbulent eddies, energy dominant turbulent eddies in the atmosphere, um, the atmospheric boundary layer, the daytime atmospheric boundary layer, as well as mountain turbulence eddies. Um, I need to recognize a number of people. Uh, much of what I discussed today, some, some of what I discussed today, I've, I've discussed in previous seminars that I've given, that people may have heard. Um, today's uh, going to be oriented more towards the field campaign that was carried out when uh, Jen Morris, Jennifer Morris, uh, visited me at the University of Colorado for a summer um, as part of her doctoral training program in wind and marine energy systems and structures from Strathclyde University. She is now graduated and working at Siemens Gamesa in Scotland. Um, other contributors, I will refer to uh, PhD research from Adam Laidley when I was at Penn State. He was one of my uh, uh, PhD students. Um, Jonathan Keller and Yi Guo um, at NREL, I've worked with them for a number of years, and they are part of a collaboration now between um, uh, NREL, um, myself, and the University of Strathclyde. Um, Jared Kennedy is the current PhD student uh, working with me from University of Strathclyde, um, co-advisor with Edward Hart um, at Strathclyde University. So all these people and others actually um, require some recognition, including Sue, I should add. Uh, Sue and I worked on wind-related stuff some years ago. Um, all right, so I would like to explain sort of the flow of the discussion today. I'll begin with quick um, reminders of what the energy containing turbulence structure looks like in the daytime atmospheric boundary layer. Um, this will sort of lay the groundwork 
to um, uh, what comes uh, later. This is work that's based on high fidelity, large eddy simulation. Um, uh, um, Adam Laidley's uh, PhD thesis and several other students, uh, as well as Jared's thesis now. Um, and uh, this is um, the atmospheric boundary layer during the daytime in which there is a turbulent uh, turbine rotor, wind turbine rotor embedded using the actuator line model for the wind turbine blades. Um, the main point is to compare some of the key results from the computational experiment uh, that was done by Adam um, in, uh, to show that the similar kinds of responses uh, exist on real wind turbines. And in this case, it's the GE um, 1.5 megawatt wind turbine at the National Wind Technology Center, the NREL National Wind Technology Center, just south of Boulder, um, where it's, the wind turbine is largely being forced by mountain generated eddies coming from the west over the Rocky Mountains. Um, we want to compare the statistics from the mountain generated um, eddies with the atmospheric boundary layer turbulence eddies. Um, this will be done with the computations, but it will also be done by examining the flow um, along the mountains where the mountain eddies are not forming. So the turbulence is atmospheric boundary layer turbulence. Um, and we want to compare all of these three cases um, and make some um, validation of, of the key results that came out of the computational experiment and some generalizations to uh, interaction between turbulence in the atmosphere and wind turbines in general. There are a couple uh, other issues that have to be discussed as part of this. One is that the data from the 1.5 megawatt wind turbine at, uh, at the NREL site um, will require a downselect process. I won't have time to go into the details of that downselect process, but I will refer to it. Um, and it'll be necessary in order to examine the north-south flow um, where the nacelle anemometer had to be used. We have to show that the same statistics can be produced um, with the nacelle anemometer as with the Met Tower anemometers, and that will be done with the westward uh, flow. Um, so this is the flow of today's talk. So let me begin by just reminding everybody what the atmospheric boundary layer looks like, um, its turbulence structure, and how that turbulence structure interacts with uh, wind turbines. So what I'm showing here is a large eddy simulation, very similar to the one uh, that I'm going to be describing the results for in just a minute. Um, this is the daytime atmospheric boundary, boundary layer, the moderately convective state where um, the um, stability parameter, the capping inversion height divided by the uh, Obakoff length scale um, is between minus four and eight typically. That's typical atmospheric boundary layer, flat planes, uh, horizontal surface, um, quasi-stationary equilibrium boundary layers. The main point here is what we're showing is a horizontal plane with the horizontal um, velocity, fluctuating velocity, displayed where blue is below the mean and red is above the mean. And what we're looking at is the typical um, coherent streak structure in high Reynolds number of turbulent boundary layers that lives in the surface layer. And that's where the wind turbine rotor lives, is in the surface layer of the atmospheric boundary layer. And the main points here are that these are elongated eddies in the streamwise direction that pass over the, the wind turbine rotor. Obviously, they're, they're rather strong, plus or minus several meters per second relative to a mean that's typically around 10 or 15 meters per second. So they're really quite strong fluctuations relative to the mean. And they have uh, several characteristic time scales that I'll mention um, in just a second. But the main point here is to recognize that the horizontal scale of in the transverse direction of these eddies is of order of the rotor diameter. And that's important because that means that the interactions are going to be strong, and they are. Um, all right, so um, the, the application really is on the drivetrain, the fact that these non-steady interactions between the um, rotor blades, uh, the rotor, um, and then the um, uh, the drivetrain is through the main shaft, which carries uh, fluctuations, large fluctuations in forces and moments down the main shaft and impacts uh, the various components along the drivetrain, the first of which is the main bearing, and that's going to be uh, the focus of the um, application of these results in, in the discussion today. The other point in the, in the lower left-hand plot is to make the point that um, the turbulence is is three-dimensional uh, and it sweeps through the rotating uh, blades and creates these non-steady responses, which are of three uh, basic um, time scales based on previous work from uh, students that I've had in the past um, at Penn State. Um, these three time scales are first the 
it'd be advection time for the eddies to pass. So, so this is a, a signal of the torque um, as a function of time, which is actually from a movie that um, um, this, this paper is about here. Um, and, uh, and it shows how uh, the longest time scale in, in this series is on the order of say 60 to 90 minutes, 50 to 90 minutes. It's, it's the characteristic advection time for these eddies as they sweep through uh, the rotor plane. Um, the second, of course, is that these blades are rotating through the turbulence. So there's a 1P that is a one rotation and a, th and a 3P because there's three blades. Three blades rotating through the turbulence will create a very well-defined signal. And you can see this, for example, in this torque as a function of time signal, where a third important time scale, uh, this is a sub-second time scale that creates these ramp-like structures in the moments that are passing down the drivetrain from the hub. Um, of the rotor. So three characteristic time scales, one uh, on the order of a minute, um, one on the order of seconds, and one sub-second. Um, this is likely an important uh, time scale for the function of the uh, main bearing. All right, so uh, we are going to fo focus in this talk uh, on the moments that are generated at the hub from the rotation of these blades through the uh, turbulence eddying structure shown on the bottom left, the rotation of these blades. Uh, it will create forces and moments um, um, on the main shaft uh, here at the hub. Um, so this moment vector can be pointing uh, in different directions, and that's really the main point. The X component of the moment vector is the torque. So that's the one that we're most interested in from a power production point of view. It's, it's what creates the power. Uh, unfortunately, the turbulence eddies push this vector um, off the axis here and create a uh, out of plane, what we're going to call an out of plane OOP bending moment. Um, and it's the out of plane bending moment components that force uh, um, the main bearing, that create the aerodynamic contributions to the forces on the main bearing. Uh, and so that's what I'm showing here. Um, there's another term that involves the forces at the hub, um, but work that has come out of uh, Jared's uh, research uh, is showing that this is a term that is negligible compared to this term uh, in context with the generation of non-steady variations in the force on the main bearing. And it's the force on the main bearing that then creates the problems with the potential problems with the main bearing. It, it creates a load zone that is moving around in, in, in time. Um, and changing its magnitude and time. And this movement um, is what is speculated to perhaps lead to um, breakdown of, of the individual rollers, bre breakdown of the main bearing and potential failures of the main bearing. Um, another uh, moment that we'll be discussing from the experimental campaign. So this moment comes out of the computations but the experimental campaign does not measure this moment. There's sensors that measure the moment on the main shaft and the main shaft moment is not exactly the same as the moment at the hub. Uh, this, is, this is the relationship. These are all equilibrium uh, moment balances. This is the relationship between the two, again, isolating the aerodynamic contribution uh, and they are proportional to each other plus this term that involves the same components to the forces acting on the hub here, um, which we argue are small compared to these. And they're un actually turn out to be uncorrelated to the uh, time variations in the forces on the, on the main bearing itself. So these are the, uh, these are the moment uh, contributions that we're going to be focusing on, the uh, so-called out of plane bending moment acting on the hub and, uh, and acting uh, on the main shaft um, with the um, field campaign. All right. so. These are the uh, results that we want to really get into with the um, field campaign analysis um, and understand and, and, and verify, validate. Um, so the, these are results that, that um, I think are important for the, the time varying forces uh, and moments that are acting on the main shaft and the main bearing in particular. In particular, um, I'm plotting uh, from, or Adam is plotting from his PhD thesis here, um, the torque as a function of time and the out of plane bending moment magnitude as a function of time. Um, and you can notice first off, that they look quite different um, and they are uncorrelated. They are, and that's the main point is that the, variations that are associated with the power generation mechanisms on the wind turbine, that those time variations are uncorrelated to the time variations that are actually stimulating uh, the force on the main bearing, these, these variations here that I mentioned a second ago, they're uncorrelated. Uh, that's the first observation. And the, and the first question then is, is why? That implies that the mechanisms that are driving the time variations and torque are fundamentally different from the mechanisms that are driving uh, time variations in the out of torque uh, bending moment magnitude. 
Um, a couple other observations uh, to make is that the, the, vari the, the variability relative to the trends, so the red line would be the trend line, it's a low pass filtered signal, um, but the variations relative to these trends, the, the fluctuations, um, peak to peaks, are much larger with the non-torque than they are with torque. And this we find is also the case with the experimentally measured uh, torque uh, out, of bend, out of plane bending moments versus torque on the, on the main shaft, um, as I'll mention in just a bit. All right, so the question now is what, if, if they're uncorrelated with each other, then what are they correlated to? And it turns out from the simulations that the torque uh, is, uh, the variations in the torque is strongly correlated with the variations in the average horizontal velocity, the velocity that's going into the rotor plane as a function of time. These are varying with time. The blades are cutting through the internal structure of these variations, but the overall changes in the average velocity over the rotor plane is strongly correlated with the torque. And that's also true uh, for the thrust. The thrust, the average wind speed through the rotor plane and the torque are all uh, very highly correlated with one another in the computations, um, not as highly in the, in the experiments, but still very highly correlated in the experiments. So then the question is, well, if these are related to the uh, changes in the horizontal velocity on average over the, over the rotor disc, then what are the non-torque bending moments related to? And it turns out that they're related to the asymmetrical distribution of the uh, internal velocity structure uh, on the rotor plane as a function of time. Uh, this is quantified with a parameter that we developed called, we call the asymmetry parameter. It's quantified up here, I won't go into the details, but the main point is that uh, as these blades are cutting through uh, an asymmetrical distribution of horizontal velocity, it produces moments, um, out of plane moments uh, acting uh, at the hub, which pass down uh, the main shaft and affect the components along the main shaft. So that was the basic observations from, from Adam's uh, thesis. Uh, and these we think are important. Um, we're in process of analyzing the relevance uh, of these out of plane bending moments to the uh, function of the main bearing with the, uh, the uh, work that's going on now with Adam, uh, with um, um, Jared's thesis. All right, but let's go into the uh, analysis of of these data from a uh, of these results from a field data perspective. This is the work that Jen Morrison did with me when she visited a couple years ago from from Scotland. Um, there's Jen. Um, so I'd like to now spend the rest of the uh, discussion on these experiments. So we took data from the NREL um, GE 1.5 megawatt wind turbine at the um, National Wind Technology Center site, so-called Flatirons NREL um, site, um, south of Boulder, Colorado. You can see the, uh, the, the Rocky Mountains uh, front range uh, here, uh, as I'll show you in a second. This is the wind turbine um, that uh, the data were, were collected from, 1.5 megawatt, about um, 80, 90 meter, uh, 87 meter uh, diameter of the rotor. Uh, and this is the Met Tower, which is directed uh, to the west. So the, the um, eddies that are generated, so here's the wind turbine here, here's the front range here, Boulder is here. Uh, I am sitting at my house somewhere about right there, right now. Um, uh, and you can see behind Sue's picture, the front range, and here's the front range from above with Google Maps. And most of the winds are westerly, so we segregate the winds into westerly and northerly, southerly, as I'll mention in a minute. But they create a separation off the mountains and eddies that are then passed um, over the wind turbine. And it's these eddies that we're measuring the response of. It's about four and a half kilometers from the uh, front range of mountains. And then of course the Rockies spread to the west. Um, in front of the um, wind turbine is that net tower that I pointed out. It's 162.2 meters to the west. It was perfectly per purposefully placed uh, to the west many years ago um, in order to capture the westerly winds, which were the predominant winds um, at the site. Um, the last point is to recognize that there's separation off these mountains. So I took this from a paper by Hearst et al. showing separation off of a cube. Um, this would be uh, in, in a relative sense, roughly where the wind turbine sits relative to this cube. Um, and the point is that separation has uh, reattached and we're looking at the eddies um, in the um, wake uh, of this cube after um, reattachment. 
<clears throat> All right, so this is the Met Tower. Most of the data were analyzed from the um, anemometers in this region, mostly from this anemometer, which is a cup anemometer at the uh, hub height uh, of the wind turbine. This shows the rotor disc um, of the wind turbine. Um, on the wind turbine itself, uh, we used data that were had been collected from instruments that NREL had placed on this wind turbine, this GE 1.5 megawatt wind turbine, many years ago. Um, not all the data are, are usable because of calibration and issues and so on, but the data that we used, the one we were most interested in were, were the strain gauge moment components that were measured, the out of plane strain gauge moment components that were measured um, about le less, somewhat less than a meter uh, beyond the main bearing. Okay, so much of the data I'm going to show us from here. We'll also show some data from strain gauges that we're measuring from one of the blade routes and data from the tower base. But we're mainly interested in this moment for the reason that I explained earlier, that that's the one that is most directly related to the forces that are acting uh, on the main bearing. Um, just to show you the power uh, curve, these are our uh, power curve uh, generations from the data that we had. Uh, and it shows that the rated uh, wind speed is, is arrived at about 14 meters per second, but pitch kicks in at something around 10 meters per second. Uh, and pitch interferes with the correlations that we're interested in. So uh, pretty much all of the data we analyze is in region two um, at these uh, speeds uh, down in here. Uh, interestingly, <clears throat> um, RPM is, is, is changing during this region, but it reaches um, a peak at about 10 uh, and a half meters per second compared to the rated power, which is about 14 meters per second. But the main point is that most of the, uh, all pretty much all the analysis will be from this part of the power curve. All right, so this is the approach uh, that we took. We're really interested in the interaction between atmospheric boundary layer eddies and the wind turbine. And these would be in the northerly southerly winds, which are not experiencing um, the uh, separation coming off the mountains with the westerly winds. So, but uh, in order to analyze northerly southerly winds, we have to use the nacelle anemometer because the Met Tower is not in the right location. So the approach we took is we first analyzed in great detail the westerly winds for these mountain turbulence uh, data sets. There were 139 10 minute data sets that we analyzed. These were all um, precipitation free periods uh, in the afternoon when the atmospheric boundary layer is in sort of a quasi stationary state uh, period um, in the months of uh, June and July in 2014, if I recall, I neglected to put the date down here it was 2016, I think, perhaps. Um, uh, once uh, these have been analyzed, we analyze using the uh, nacelle uh, anemometer in addition to the Met Tower, and, and we confirm that we get the same correlations, the same statistics, uh, and then that allows us to analyze the northerly southerly data sets, which have the atmospheric boundary layer eddies uh, embedded in them. There are 33 of those. So that's the approach uh, that we, we have taken, and I'll go through that now. All right, so and these are the westerly uh, data that we're going to uh, first discuss. Um, and uh, the, the issue now is as these eddies, so the objective is to isolate the eddies that pass the Met Tower uh, and then subsequently pass uh, the wind turbine. And obviously the velocity data is coming off the Met Tower. So we need to confirm that the eddies are the same um, in both places. Um, there are a number of ways. The first thing that we do is we compute the correlation between the velocity at this uh, anemometer and the velocity at the cell anemometer uh, as a function of uh, critical time shift. Uh, and when the core of this is the correlation is a function of that critical time shift. And when it reaches a peak, uh, then we argue that that's the optimal time when this eddy uh, with the, the velocity from this eddy is, 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 is the same um, eddy as what's uh, being, um, uh, is what's stimulating uh, the, the, the wind turbine itself through the aerodynamic interactions with the blades. All right, so we call that the critical time shift and we calculate that for every 10 minute um, uh, period. And we compare that with the average advection time where we take the average velocity over the 10 minute period and we compute the time it would take for the eddies if they were frozen to move to the wind turbine. And we're expecting that that time to be correlated um, with this time, the critical time shift. Um, so that's the idea that if the advection time uh, equals the critical time shift, then that is suggesting a turbulence eddy that is carrying a fluctuation from the Met Tower 
um, to the wind turbine. All right, so we started with 139 uh, 10-minute uh, data periods, where uh, on this axis, we're plotting the advection time, this, this, this average uh, time it would take for the eddies to pass from the Met Tower to the wind turbine. Uh, against the critical time shift, um, this solid line would be if they are equal, the data are clustered um, around that solid line, but uh, they're not exactly on that solid line, as, as of course, we expected. Um, and then there are many outlier, uh, outliers. So, so we had to go through a, a, a series of down selects um, to uh, optimize the probability that the eddy that is passing the Met Tower is the same uh, eddy that is influencing the wind turbine downstream of the Met Tower. Um, I won't go into all the details. We're writing a paper on this that'll go out pretty soon. Um, and uh, if you're interested, I can send you a draft of that paper. But there's basically three characteristics that we corrected for or that we down selected for one is misalignment in wind direction where we uh, um, we can measure the, the 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 direction of the velocity at the met tower and uh, if it's too misaligned um, we uh, eliminate um, um, those data sets from the from the set um, if the wind speed is too low then the eddy structure will change significantly between the met mast and the wind turbine. So we have a process of eliminating. Actually, these, the, these are combined in, an, in, in a down select process. And then really important is we uh, had to remove uh, periods where uh, pitch was important. And uh, that, that basically eliminates all of the data uh, above about 9.5 meters per second and probably a, a few of the data sets in, in here as well. Um, and again, I don't have time to go through the details of, of, of that down select process just to know that we did it. But what that ended up, uh, what we ended up with from the 139 data sets is 56, it's <clears throat> 56 final uh, data set periods. These are the 56 data set periods. There are still a few outliers. These three here and this one here um, are, we, you know, are outliers. If you remove those, uh, the correlation between the advection, average advection time and this critical time is about 0.75, which is reasonable. Um, if you include those four outliers, it's more like 0.59. All right, so these are the data that we actually use to analyze uh, the results that I'm going to show you now. So the, the, <clears throat> the first issue is to ask whether, uh, to the extent possible, the um, results from Adam's thesis that indicated no correlation between the torque and the out of plane bending moment magnitude um, a strong correlation between the torque and the average wind speed over the rotor. Uh, we didn't have any data on thrust, um, um, uh, whether, whether these were um, also found to be the case with the experimental data. So we're looking for high correlations between the main shaft torque and the rotor uh, plane average wind speed. We're looking for low correlation, very low correlation between the um, main shaft bending moment, keeping in mind that this is not the hub bending moment, the main shaft bending moment <clears throat> and the rotor average wind speed. Um, keeping in mind also with the field, because we are restricted to uh, a line of data from the Met Tower, um, we don't have uh, data over the rotor disc, so we couldn't form um, in, a in a symmetry parameter. Uh, and when we average the velocity over the rotor disc, we're actually averaging the velocity over the Met tower anemometers that um, are within the rotor disk. So it's not exactly the same thing. But we get very similar um, results from the field data uh, correlations uh, that we received, that we got from the computer simulations of the atmospheric boundary layer, daytime atmospheric boundary layer with, um, with a uh, five megawatt um, rotor embedded um, using actuator lines. And this is being compared with mountain eddy turbulence with a 1.5 megawatt uh, wind turbine. We'll go into the, the relationships in, in, in just a minute, but the main point is that um, the correlation between the torque um, and the wind velocity, these are the fluctuating torque and wind velocity components are very high as they were with the computer simulations. And the correlation between the out of plane bending moment magnitude, the non torque uh, moment magnitude, and the fluctuating winds are very low, as are the correlations between the torque and the non torque bending moments. 
Um, and this, this, this just gives in two examples uh, of many uh, eight, 10 minute uh, periods where uh, correlation is good and, and correlation is, is poor. So we conclude that at least from these results that the um, wind turbine um, experiencing mountain um, eddy um, response to mountain eddies uh, coming from the west over the front range is producing a response on the 1.5 GE wind turbine uh, with the same correlation segregation as was calculated uh, from the correlations between the hub moments. Again, these are with these, all these moments are, are measured on the main shaft, uh, but, the, but the very similar, uh, very consistent results with the computational um, experiments. Um, just to show some additional uh, correlations, um, one of the blade root uh, correlations they have the flap and the edge uh, bending moments, um, strong correlation, not as strong as before, but strong correlation with the flap. The flap, of course, is responding similarly um, to the horizontal velocity. It's in this direction, but the edge bending moment is, is very small. Yeah, the edge bending moment is the, uh, is the time variations associated with the blades cutting through the internal structure of the eddies. Uh, and that's consistent with the large variations observed in the out of plane bending moment. Um, so these results, uh, we argue, um, are physically consistent with the torque versus non-torque results from the, um, from the previous uh, slide for the uh, field data and also from the computer simulations. Tower base has a strong correlation um, with the uh, horizontal. This, this is all correlations with the horizontal wind speed, the wind speed through the uh, rotor disc. So um, um, it's, it's, at least they're consistent, they're in the same direction. But really the main point um, is the, um, is the out of plane bending moments. So in order to compare with the north south winds in which the atmospheric boundary layer eddies um, are um, uh, attached, um, are embedded, um, we need to show that we can use the nacelle um, uh, anemometer, um, it's a cup anemometer, uh, and produce the same correlations that we got uh, with the westerly winds using the Met Tower. Um, and um, th that's, that's what this is uh, showing. Uh, we have uh, data to, to, to show that. Uh, the, the, these, this is the blade flap against the wind, the tower base against the wind, the torque against the wind, and the non-torque uh, non against the wind, the outer plane bending moment against the wind. These are all um, high correlations. These are particularly um, high. Um, th these data were actually partly used to, uh, to um, segregate the data in terms of pitch. Um, these are low pitch events up here and these are high pitch events. But even with the high pitch events, when the correlations um, are, not, um, uh, are not physical, we get negative correlations. The relationship between the Met Tower correlation coefficient on this axis uh, I'm sorry, the Met Tower is on this axis and the nacelle anemometer on this axis is very high. It's around 0.9 in both cases. Uh, and in these two cases, it's, it's uh, 0.74 and 0.86. So we argue that these correlations are uh, very high, we argue, and certain high enough that allows us to argue that we can use the nacelle anemometer to analyze the northerly southerly winds in which um, atmospheric boundary layer eddies um, are embedded. Okay, so that allows us with the field data to compare mountain eddy response with atmospheric boundary layer um, eddy response. And of course, the simulations are atmospheric boundary layer um, eddy response. All right, so here I'm going to just give some basic comparisons uh, between the mountain eddy response, the westerly um, wind response, and the atmospheric boundary layer eddy response, the northerly, southerly winds. So I'm, I'm listing a variety of parameters. The number of data sets that were available, I mentioned before, 56 versus uh, 33. These are 10 minute uh, data set periods. So we can look at variability uh, among them, which turns out to be important. Um, it, it turns out that from the West, the average wind speed over these 56 and 33 data sets um, is about a meter per second higher coming from the West than from the North and the South uh, when you segregate the data. Um, the turbulence intensity, which is the one we were mo more interested in, is about twice as high from the west uh, than it is from the north-south. Um, so the mountain-generated eddies are stronger uh, in magnitude than the, um, 
northerly, uh, southerly um, eddies. Um, interestingly, however, it turns out that the eddy structure, don't have time to go into it, but the eddy structure is not all that different from the westerly eddies, the mountain generated eddies versus the uh, northerly, southerly eddies, the atmospheric boundary layer eddies. And this is just one indicator of that, that the integral time scale for the horizontal fluctuations um, are pretty much the same. But um, through uh, uh, other analysis like this, we've actually concluded that the westerly eddies are a little bit larger uh, than the atmospheric boundary layer eddies come, coming from the north and the south. They're uh, stronger, as, as shown from, from this, this data right here. Um, but they're comparable in in time, uh, in size, and in in the characteristic passage time uh, through the wind turbine rotors. So they're not horribly different from each other, even though they're generated by very different mechanisms. Um, so this is just showing the first sort of comparison in results between these mountain generated eddies from the west and the atmospheric boundary layer eddies north south. The blue is west, uh, the red is north south, and we're showing three comparisons, uh, out of plane bending moment, torque, and blade flap bending moment. The out of plane bending moments, interestingly, are comparable, um, surprisingly. Um, even though the intensity is higher coming from the west, the out of plane bending moment response is pretty much the same. Um, the torque, um, there is some difference. Um, the north-south uh, generates less power um, than the westerly, at least for these data sets, these segregated data sets, it generates less power. Of course, we've, we've removed uh, the high um, velocity uh, periods when pitch and controllers and so on are active. So you have to keep that in mind. But for the data that we analyze, torque um, is lower uh, coming from the north-south. Um, and also the blade flap bending moment, which kind of goes along with the torque is, is, is lower as well. But interestingly, the out of plane bending moments are not much different in magnitude, um, which we were surprised. Um, the correlations um, are very similar to what we, um, what we measured for the westerly winds. So the uh, correlation between the torque um, and the winds is something like 0.7, it's a little bit lower. We had 0.8 something before, now we have 0.7 something before. But in comparison to torque, um, non-torque versus wind and torque versus non-torque, which are pretty much uncorrelated um, in these data um, as well. Uh, and similarly, the blade flap bending moment, it's not as high as it was before, but in comparison uh, between flap and edge, the correlations with the wind velocity, time variations in the wind um, is again, uh, very, very similar, uncorrelated here, strong correlation here, not as strong as before, but still. Uh, and then likewise uh, with the tower base strong correlation. So we argue that these results um, are essentially the same um, as the um, as the westerly from north, north, south with atmospheric boundary layer versus westerly. We argue that they're about the same. And of course, we've all re already uh, shown that they are uh, essentially uh, the same, very similar to what was measured with the computational experiment. So we argue that these results, uh, the previous results uh, are showing um, that this is a generalizable, the, these correlations between um, torque and wind and torque and non-torque and so on are generalizable to eddies uh, in a general sense that have uh, the right size uh, and the right strength uh, to interact with, uh, with wind turbines. So this could impact, for example, the placement of wind turbines, uh, uh, placement of wind farms uh, relative to topography, for example, but it has uh, a strong impact on the um, fluctuations in the moments that are generating the fluctuations in the force on the main bearing, uh, which was one of our primary motivations here. So um, another interesting thing that came out of this um, analysis that is surprising to us and a little bit disconcerting um, in regards to the wind turbine uh, uh, function of the main uh, main uh, of the drivetrain. Um, so when I gave this talk uh, a few months ago at Penn State, uh, somebody in the audience pointed out to me that the torque um, magnitude, if you sort of draw an average line through it, it's not very different from the non-torque. And that's surprising. It is surprising because the wind turbine is trying to generate torque because that's what goes into power. Power is proportional to the torque. It's the torque times the, um, times the rotor speed. Um, 
so it's it's kind of uh, um, it's kind of surprising that the out of plane contributions are pretty much as large as the power generation uh, components of the uh, main uh, of the of the uh, of the moments on the main shaft. So we checked this with the with the data set westerly. Uh, it turned out that in these ten minute uh, periods, the on average the out of plane bending moment is a little bit larger than the torque. And, not, not, and here it's a little bit smaller, here it's a little bit larger. But in the northerly, southerly, it's quite a bit larger than the torque. So, so, so this seems to be a generalizable result as well. It's surprising that the um, outer plane bending moments, the non-torque bending moments are as large or larger. And because the variability is so much larger with the outer plane bending moments than on the torque, there are many instant periods where locally in time, um, torque is dominated by, uh, by non-torque bending moments. Um, also, uh, as I just pointed out, there's a, there's a, lar a lot of, of variability from 10 minute sample to 10 minute sample, uh, there's tremendous variability. So that's kind of another takeaway is that these turbulence interactions create large variability, but that the, both the atmospheric and the mountain turbulence eddies are creating large out of plane bending moments. Basically what, what happens is that this moment vector, which we would like to be perfectly aligned uh, with the main shaft, because that all goes into torque, is being pushed off uh, the axis and creating an out of plane component uh, that in, interacts with, that creates these forces on the main bearing that is really substantial as larger, larger than the, than the torque components. Uh, we think that's important. All right, so, um, yeah, uh, last time I gave this talk, I went over. So this time it looks like I'm a little under, but that's good. All right, so let's go, that gives me time to go through the conclusions um, in a little bit more detail here. So the first, of course, is that our computational experiments, um, we argue that the, this field campaign has validated the basic results of the computational experiment. That's important because it allows us to use the computational experiments to draw conclusions. Uh, as to what's causing uh, these, um, uh, these time variations and perhaps um, uh, methods to mitigate these variations if one is interested in mitigating these variations to reduce the loading on the main bearing, for example. Um, so we argue that we have validated the computational experiments. Um, so Jared's thesis, which is also based on computational experiments, we feel that this work makes, makes it more relevant um, uh, because it's validated. All right, but in terms of the results, um, we've, had, we've, we've, we've compared three classes um, of, of experiment. One is the computational experiment. That's on a five megawatt wind turbine in a typical canonical daytime atmospheric boundary layer compared with um, 1.5 megawatt wind turbine, which is experiencing mountain turbulence from the west and atmospheric boundary layer turbulence from the north-south. Of course, this is in a real atmospheric boundary layer, not canonical, um, very much not canonical. Um, in the afternoon, however, when we're trying to isolate quasi-stationary periods and so on. But it does, the fact that we compared three and we're getting very similar results in terms of correlations and so on for these three suggests that these key findings are generalizable and can be applied, for example, to the interaction between other classes of turbulence eddies, such as wake eddies uh, and wind turbines, uh, or other topography or building generated eddies and so on, uh, that we can now use these results to, um, to help us understand the impacts of placing wind turbines and wind farms in, in different places and different locations, the consequences of turbulence on the, on the dry plane. Um, another result, important result, is that when the turbulence eddies are of order the rotor diameter as they are with the atmospheric boundary layer eddies, um, and when the uh, eddy strength, the, the integral scale or the energy dominant eddies, so-called energy containing eddies, when the strength of these eddies is of order the strength from the atmospheric boundary layer or more, remember the um, mountain eddies are stronger than the atmospheric boundary layer eddies in this study, um, they, they generate very large variations in out-of-plane bending moment um, at the hub, as well as all the way down the drive train. Um, and the, the local variations in the out-of-plane bending moment often exceed torque, which has important implications for failure, potential failure mechanisms um, of the main bearing uh, versus um, the generation of power, which is what the wind turbine is all about. <clears throat> um, 
so the point is that these out of plane bending moments uh, could lead to um, wear and possible premature failures of the main bearings. Uh, and that, that means that these, these, these moments are impacting both the numerator and the denominator of the levelized cost of energy relationship. So the, the bearing failures go into the operating costs of the wind turbine and of course energy production uh, goes into the denominator. So these two different um, uh, elements in the cost of energy um, are reflected in the lack of correlation between the torque and the out of plane bending moment, which implies that um, uh, trying to control either the numerator or the denominator are going to require different strategies. And that's sort of the take one of the takeaways from the study. Um, in comparing, comparing, all right, so topography is, is another um, take away that the mountain eddies are forcing the wind turbines in a way that is different. Obviously, they're mountain eddies rather than atmospheric. They have a different structure from atmospheric boundary layer, but the response is amazingly similar in terms of the out of plane bending moments uh, and the torque. And it turns out uh, we don't have measurements of the uh, of the force, the uh, thrust from the wind turbine in the field, but we hypothesize that it's similar there um, as well. Um, so, um, so even though the mountain eddies are somewhat stronger, they're different structure and so on, but they're of the same order and size, they have the same correlations. Uh, so the, the, again, these are generalizable uh, results and, um, and, and they can be used at least in a qualitative sense uh, for, um, for determining um, impacts of turbulence in the atmosphere from different sources on wind turbine function. Um, there are just a couple of points to keep in mind from this study. Uh, we assume rigid blades uh, in the field. Of course, the blades are not rigid, um, but in the simulations, they were rigid. Um, constant RPM, uh, we isolated constant RPM periods from the field, but in reality, pitch is changing, controls are causing um, uh, the RPM to change, the pitch to change and so forth. So one of the issues that Jared will be studying with his work is the impact of uh, elasticity in the blades and uh, controls um, in the blades um, in, in future work. But um, the, the main takeaway is that these interactions between turbulence eddies and wind turbine functions seem to be uh, generalizable uh, to the point that one should take these into account um, in the placement of wind turbines relative to each other, relative to mountain topography um, and so on. All right, thank you very much. I hit it just right on time, thanks. Thank you, Jim. I hope you're hearing all the virtual applause. Uh, very nice seminar. Um, okay, so we're in the Q&A portion. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll call on you, or if you type a question, I'll be glad to read it. Uh, we already have one from Balaji of GE Research. Do you want to ask it yourself, Balaji, or? Um... Uh, sure, sure, so, hey, Jim. Um, hey, Balaji. I, maybe I'm, I don't know if I missed it uh, because I joined a few minutes late, but uh, were you able to quantify yaw misalignments to the uh, turbine from the met mass information? Because usually these yaw misalignments kind of contribute to the out of plane uh, loads that you're talking about. Right. So, yeah, I should have listed that on my final slide, too, as one of the restrictions is that we have purposely restricted the data. Well, the simulations are done with, with zero mis misalignment in yaw, um, so perfectly aligned with the mean velocity. But also in the analysis of the field data, uh, we removed sample um, where uh, yaw misalignment was significant. So that is another one of the uh, things that should be kept in mind about the results. All right, thanks. Hey, Mark Kelly has a question. Oh, hey, Mark, long time no see. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jim. Thanks for the, the nice uh, talk there. Yeah, a couple questions. Um, one of them was, uh, yeah, it was cool that you showed the um, the ratio of uh, non-torque producing to torque producing, or actually it's reciprocal, say. Um, it was bigger, you know, it, it, it changed with the uh, northwest versus the, the north-south versus the west-east direction. And wouldn't an engineer just kind of squint at that and say, uh, that ratio is just basically going to be monotonic with turbulence intensity for the bearing, right? The higher turbulence intensity is just going to have um, a higher ratio. 
uh, sorry, higher ratio of what again? You had the torque, yeah. So you had the 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 torque part divided right. the, divided by the non-torque part. So higher turbulence intensity would have a lower ratio of that because you showed these ratios of you know like forty eight percent or um, yeah, yeah. What was All right. So um, much of this was correlation. So let's see if we're going. Yeah, to yeah. Before that. that. Um, let me see. Are you talking about um, th this right here? The these this ratio of between. Um, yeah, you had I another. guess I'm not. I'm not totally clear. Um, yeah, there was a slide where you. Sh it was another one where you. Sh you had the numbers written on there. This one is this. Yeah. This is, is this yeah. One? There. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you're saying that that these should uh, increase with turbulence intensity, but. Uh, Interestingly, that I mean, we don't have enough data to actually, you know, make a plot of turbulence intensity against uh, against the ratio between these mountain versus ABL eddies. But in in these results, the um, out of plane bending moment ratio is larger for the uh, northerly southerly than for the mountain eddies, and the mountain eddies are stronger than the northerly southerly. So. You know they they, they don't the inverse, what yeah. you what you what you just suggested. Why I don't know whether you have to keep in mind that that still it's thirty three data sets northerly southerly it's fifty six data sets westerly. These are ten minute periods, but they still are a sub sample of what the wind turbine experiences during its lifetime. And you have to keep that in mind. But these are the results from this study. It's yeah, different. yeah, that's cool. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, because I wondered if if you if you pick some periods where they had similar turbulence intensity, say both of them. Are oh, wrong. oh, actually, yeah, that's an interesting point. We did that. We actually um, we down selected from from these data sets for the westerly. Actually, we down selected the westerly data sets to a sub data set where the turbulence intensity was roughly the same as the northerly southerly data sets. And to be yeah. perfectly honest, I don't know if we quantified this this for those but we got we were really basically asking are these correlations or lacks of correlations the same uh, if you down select the westerly eddies to be ones that are sort of weaker the same 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 strength as the northerly southerly and we get the same uh correlations but we didn't actually check this parameter but maybe because of your question we'll do that oh okay cool i, I guess the other uh silly question i had is with the ge with these 1.5 megawatt GE, was that cyclic pitch control? Maybe it wouldn't matter. I don't know. But like, was it cyclic pitch control used on those or they don't have individual pitch control? Because I wondered about the vertical scale of the eddies as opposed to the horizontal. Because um, I, I, yeah. Do you have any comments? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what the pitch control has to do with the vertical versus horizontal eddies. But we, we isolated periods where uh, the wind turbine was not pitching. So no matter what the pitch control mechanisms are these data isolated periods where pitch was not changing yeah yeah uh, keep that okay. in mind um, and so that was it was not like uh it was okay so it was like not hey, just on average hey, mark, mark i think hey mark I, I think that's collective pitch control for this turbine okay 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 um okay and yeah thank you uh also for that that it's on average not pitching much there okay and the vertical versus horizontal i was just curious because the you have the time scale, yeah. The, you you said that the you know the yeah, temporal the time scale, time scale is the same. Uh, the and other times we 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 calculated all the time scales and they're all amazingly comparable between the mountain eddies and the atmospheric boundary layer northerly southerly eddies. I keep calling this ABL because that's the only thing that's creating the turbulence, but we haven't actually visualized. Uh, interesting. The eddy. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, it is interesting okay. actually. I was surprised. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question from Daniel Kirk Davidoff. Uh, what do we know about the linearity of the relationship between the out of plane bending moments and the wear on the turbine parts and on the cost of that damage? We know nothing. Um, what this is actually, so I should I should say that this this study here was stimulated by um, the thesis of, of Adam Lavely, all, all of this stuff that I talked about earlier. Um, it, was, it was stimulated by that. And when, when, when we did this work, we weren't really thinking, to be perfectly honest, of the main bearing. Um, we just noticed the, these results. And then it, it, we realized at some point that these moments are directly impacting the main bearing. And so we started thinking about the main bearing as, as an application. Um, this attracted John Keller's attention at, at NREL. 
And we are now working together to try to address the question, okay, how does all of this uh, which seems to be important. It sure looks like it's important from the numbers and so on. Um, but how is all of this impacting the premature failures that are known? Uh, the bearing is known to fail prematurely. Uh, it is not known why. There's, there's a lot of speculation uh, about why, but it is not known why. So it's possible that these turbulence interactions are uh, a primary underlying mechanism. So that's what we're exploring with Jared's thesis right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, John Keller. Oh, there's John. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, just to that question, I will add a bit of context. You know, in terms of the main bearing or or any rolling bearing, there are multiple failure modes uh, that we're concerned about. One of them is rolling contact fatigue, and at least for that failure mode, we do know that the the fatigue uh, goes up with the cube of the load, right? So if you theoretically double the load, then you have eight times the amount of fatigue uh, for that number of cycles. Having said that, uh, field data shows us that that particular failure mode is not what is observed in the premature, premature failures that actually occur. Uh, there are other failure modes like wear. And so when we talk about wear there, that's a much uh, harder failure mode to characterize and something we're still working on. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thank you, John. Okay, uh, one more from me, Jim. So at this point, what advice would you give to a developer who's trying, who's planning to site wind farm in the Lee of some mountains? <clears throat> well, um, I, I say be very thoughtful. Don't just do it. Um, we, uh, with, with um, the collaboration with Ed Hart, um, a paper just came out that Ed was lead author on, I believe he was, no, he was the lead author. Anyway, one of his students was lead author on, um, where um, data was collected from wind farms. It, it, it's very difficult, as you all know, to get wind farm developers and OEMs to provide data. Um, this, this is something that really needs to be discussed in future in the WEA meetings and so on. But at any rate, um, we were able to get um, some data um, from, from wind farm developers, but what they, and, and, and it, it, it's relevant, it shows some characteristics that may point to mechanisms, but not enough, frankly. But what they wouldn't give us was information on the topography surrounding the wind farms for the data that they were giving us. So I wanted very much, and I kept pushing on this hard, was to get the developers to give us the, an, enough information that we could maybe assess even just qualitatively the level of, of turbulence and the structure of the eddies that are interacting with the wind turbines. Um, but my, uh, uh, my uh, concern is that the, if the wind turbines are being placed sort of in a location where the strongest say separation eddies coming off of hills and so on are passing through the rotor plane, that these are going to be generating very large um, out of plane bending moments and presumably very strong forcing of the main bearing. So it should be taken into account in the design of the placement of the wind farm, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. We're at time, uh, more virtual applause for Jim. Um, next webinar, it'll be next year on January 10th. Elliot Simon of DTU will be talking about the global blockage experiment in the North Sea. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing all of you then. And thanks for joining us and hope you have a great holiday season. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good holiday. Bye-bye.